Hello, my name is Pam Pearson. I'm the director of the International Cries for Climate Initiative, which focuses on policies and programs to preserve the Earth's cryosphere in a warming climate. Um, and I am going to take you today on a real gallop through the cryosphere dynamics through the world that the, the diplomats and the scientists with ICCI deal with on a daily basis. Um, and this is an Arctic plus view because the Arctic is one cryosphere region, but we can find actually all of these dynamics in other regions as well. And while the Arctic has Greenland and Arctic sea ice and permafrost in the rest of the world, we especially have Antarctica, which is key to sea level rise, mountain glaciers, uh, sea and lake ice, permafrost and snow. And so I'm going to focus a bit on the Arctic, but also touch on other cryosphere dynamics which are important. I'm also going to be talking about different temperature and emissions pathways. This is an oversimplification, but so that you can follow along a low or 1.5 degree emissions pathway. Hazus is about 1.6 degrees in 2100. Climate modelers use that to talk primarily about 1.5 degree pathways. Current Paris commitments will get us to about 2.6 degrees in 2100. And high, and unfortunately, our current emissions pathway will have have us around 4.5 degrees by 2100. But these are also associated with CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And 1.5 is around 450. Paris has us at uh, peaking at around 600 and high emissions are anywhere from 900 to 1200. So very high pathways. Keep these in mind then as I go through these slides. The other thing I want to emphasize is how outside the norm, especially of CO2 concentrations, we are right now. Because when the planet has gone between ice ages, glacials, and interglacials, uh, CO2 has only gone between 180 and 280. These have been driven especially by very slow, slight orbital changes, and this is where we are today. So we're really outside of how the planet has functioned for the past three million years. So moving in the, into these dynamics now, Arctic sea ice loss, sea ice loss tracks very closely with CO2 emissions. Um, for every ton of CO2 that we emit, we lose about three square meters of Arctic sea ice, but it tracks especially with temperature. And by 1.7 degrees or so, there will be an ice-free period in the Arctic most summers, but that extent of ice-free conditions will grow longer and longer as temperatures rise. It may stretch as long as July to October some years once we reach already two degrees. And this means a lot for multi-year sea ice as well. Uh, you need to think about this thick multi-year sea ice as the coral reefs of the Arctic ecosystem. And it's important to preserve that if we're going to preserve any amount of uh, the Arctic ecosystem for both humans and uh, other organisms. Sea level rise uh, is mostly associated in the Arctic with Greenland, but I'm going to talk about that, especially in connection with Antarctica. But Greenland does hold about six meters of sea level rise. Um, permafrost losses today in the Arctic region are fairly extensive, but when we're talking permafrost, we need to talk about carbon emissions, not just immediately, but over time. Once thawed permafrost continues emitting carbon as both CO2 and methane over a couple of centuries. And so the higher we allow temperatures to peak, the more we're committing future generations to actually offset carbon emissions from permafrost with negative human emissions. Uh, in order to stay below certain temperatures. Moving on though to the rest of the world's cryosphere, the bad news in terms of uh, low latitude or tropical mountain glaciers is that we've already basically lost them at today's temperatures. But if we move on to the mid latitudes, the Alps, the Rockies, Patagonia, and so on, we can preserve large remnants of these glaciers at 1.5 degrees C, already by two, but definitely by three degrees, these also are lost. They will go the way of the tropical glaciers. At high latitudes and altitudes, in especially the Himalayas, on which 2.5 billion human beings depend on for at least seasonal water, far better water sustainability from snow as well as the glaciers if we can remain below 1.5 degrees. And then moving on to Antarctica, um, Antarctica and Greenland are two very different sides of the same coin, different dynamics driving them. 
But uh, Antarctica holds anywhere between five to 50 meters of sea level rise. And there's growing evidence for Antarctic thresholds due to different kinds of instabilities that could lead to tipping points that uh, may not cease occurring even if we're able to bring temperatures down again. And uh, it may be faster than most models currently show. We could see as much as 15 meters of sea level rise just from Antarctica by 2500 if we go past these thresholds. And so there's a real role for policy here. And finally, moving on to polar oceans, uh, we're beginning to see unprecedented levels of acidification as CO2 rises. The oceans are absorbing our CO2. And in a high emission scenario, which you see in the globe above, uh, you could see vast amounts of both the Arctic and the Southern Oceans, both uh, really important to fisheries, uh, already by 2100, and even in a 1.5 scenario, you see some extensive uh, acidific high acidification levels even in uh, parts of the Arctic. And actually, we're seeing this already today, some shell damage in polar waters, and we're only at 415. And for ocean species, acidification is essentially permanent because the recovery time, it takes 50 to 70,000 years for uh, these oceans to buffer. And so keeping CO2 levels low is really important for the world's oceans. So cryosphere thresholds are all about temperature and CO2. And this has implications then when we talk about climate altering technologies. Um, one of the aspects of uh, polar warming is that most of it actually is not coming from dynamics that are going on at the poles. Most of it actually comes from lower latitudes. This shows heat transport from the North Atlantic into the waters around Greenland. Um, there's also atmospheric heat transport. So just doing something about warming in the Arctic, it may slow things slightly, but the bulk of the warming is actually coming from the other parts of the Earth. Um, when you're looking at uh, climate altering technologies that involve sulfate injection in order to reflect the sun's rays, we can't forget about acid rain, uh, which is an impact that came from sulfate pollution from coal-fired power plants. And as you can see here, uh, and those of you who were around then, this is really in many ways how the environmental movement got started because of acid rain impacts on the world's forests. Um, Moving on to another kind of climate altering technology, bioenergy carbon capture and storage. It's been put forward that this could be something that could be extensively used in the Arctic, but we need to recall that these ecosystems are already under stress and quite fragile from dynamics such as permafrost collapse. You see a, a collapse there in the upper left, thermokarst lakes, uh, and also as the Arctic warms from peat and forest fires. So you may manage to capture carbon in biomass, but if you get a single bad fire, that's lost to the atmosphere. In terms of governance challenges, we do have a couple of forums that already act, especially on the poles. There are others in mountain regions that I'm not going to go into here, but the Arctic Council is known as a policy shaping and not a policy making organization. The Antarctic Treaty has 54 parties, various scientific uh, committees, but what's common to both forums is that in terms of climate, they have been willing to talk about climate impacts on their regions, but they've been very resistant to climate action. And I speak as someone who has tried to advocate for get better uh, and more uh, uh, proactive climate action in both forums, but they defer on this most often to the UNFCCC as the forum for climate. And there is an argument for that because in terms of climate altering technologies, Policies anywhere do have global impacts. And speaking with my diplomatic hat on, I can say it is always tempting to take old problems to new forums, but they most often follow you there. On the other hand, though, the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees very specifically addressed staying within 1.5 and as much as possible within 450 for carbon dioxide. And that requires rapid systematic changes, but it remains possible with sharp reductions in the next decade, carbon neutrality by 2050 in all sectors and among all countries and stakeholders. And what this looks like graphically here is sharp reductions again in the next decade, carbon neutrality by 2050, and then some level of carbon dioxide removal later in the century 
For cryosphere, the less reliance is better and early as possible prior to 2060 in order to prevent overshoot. Um, but are these changes actually possible? And I spoke as recently as last week with a couple of the authors, uh, lead authors of the uh, special report on 1.5 degrees, and it is still physically possible for us to remain within 1.5. It's environmentally possible. We have all the technology we need. We have uh, the not just the economics that allows us to do it, but it will be economically advantageous. What's lacking is political will, and that is going to be up to us. So if anyone is telling you that we can't stay within 1.5 degrees, we can. That is a won't. We're deciding not to do that, and that is our decision. So uh, to summarize on temperature and emission pathways for the cryosphere, overshoot is not an option. 450 is an outer CO2 limit because of the reaction in polar oceans. We can't really rely on so-called barren Arctic regions for um, CDR biomass for a variety of reasons. Also because Arctic regions are not barren, but they're unique with self-determining indigenous cultures and ecosystems that are already under threat. Don't forget threats of acid rain. The cryosphere responds to peak temperature. Um, and we need to recall that there are important human mountain ecosystems outside of the Arctic. So from a governance perspective then, from cryosphere, carbon neutrality by 2050, 50 by 30, 50% reductions by 2030, limited CDR and only with the above and preferably begun well prior to 2060 with no overshoot, focus on reductions post-stabilization, um, solar radiation management approaches carry high risk. And finally, let's not confuse won't with can't, policies versus physics. Governance is probably going to be no easier for carbon altering technologies than our current negotiations. And let's avoid self-fulfilling prophecies. In other words, let's not declare defeat prematurely. So a healthy cryosphere is a healthy climate. And uh, if you're looking for citations of any of these dynamics or conclusions, they're contained in the Cryosphere 1.5 report that we released at the COP in Madrid last year. And I look forward to your questions.